Hey. Time for Matthew 14. Let me watch going here. Matthew 14. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his, his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. So uh, there's there were several Herods. Um, the Herod... The, there was a Herod that was in power when Jesus was born that had all the uh, boys two years younger around Bethlehem area murdered because he was trying to keep uh, the king, the, the Jesus from being king, the new king coming, even though he was like in his 70s. <laughs> At the time, and had his time was short on earth. He was afraid of losing his his rule to a a child king. Anyway, he had he had sons. He had a bunch of wives, a bunch of sons. He ended up putting a lot of sons and wives to death. But and so he was a very evil king. Uh, and this uh, when he died, though. It, it, control was given to um, three of his sons uh, the kingdom was divided, or the, his governing area were divide, was divided into four parts that's what a tetrarch is is a ruler of a fourth uh, one of his sons let's see which I got notes on this keep on hitting the reference uh this is to Herod uh, Antipas, this, is this particular Herod. The previous Herod gave half to Herod Archias, a quarter went to Herod Philip, and another quarter went to Herod Antipas, which covers Israel. So that's the the Herod we're talking about here is, is the son of the Herod that was in power when Jesus was born. Now this guy, this, the first Herod, was really evil. He was, he was a, a architectural genius. I mean, he was very good architectural wise. He's the one that had the uh, the temple rebuilt. Um, but this Herod was more of a playboy. He was uh, he wasn't interested in anything but the, the living lasciviously, <laughs> and he was uh, not a very good ruler. And he was he was pretty much spineless, as you'll find out. Uh, but he had stolen Philip's wife, his brother, the other one of the other tetrarchs. So he and for uh, so let's go back to verse three. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. So he had divorced his his wife, this particular Herod, and had taken his brother's wife. Uh, well, I mean, she was willing. She, it was a seduction, I guess you would call it. Um, but he, he had his his brother's wife. For John had John said unto him, "It is not lawful for thee to have her." And when he would have put him to death, and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So. He wanted to kill him, but he was a, he was afraid. <laughs> he was afraid of the people. So he's got he has a fear problem. So he's afraid of the people. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now this is a pretty simple it's pretty simply said in English, but if you look at the word danced and pleased there, you can easily tell that it was more than just a dance. Let's see, I got us we'll read this note here. It's an undulating dance is the way that is the verb the word dance there is the word uh orchis orchisado and it means to uh, for, um to dance from the rank 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 like or regular motion. 
So this is more likely like a belly dance, uh, something like a belly dance. Uh, of Herodias has danced before them and pleased Herod. Now that word pleased there, it's, it doesn't mean like Herod was pleased. It meant that she was focusing on pleasing Herod. So you can kind of think like of a belly dance or you could think of um, a bachelor party or something like that where a stripper and you got the stripper and the stripper's focus is on the bachelor. It's the same type of thing that's going on here. Although it's, I don't know how close to a stripper she actually was. but uh, So the uh, pleased word there, the word pleased means... Uh, exciting through the idea of exciting emotion to be agreeable to seek to be agreeable to a certain person so that's the pleased herod so so basically this girl was just being doing a strip tease for this guy and which is just weird because it's not this is not remember this is not his daughter this is his stepdaughter whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. And she, being before instructed of her mother, so her mother put her up to this. <laughs> His wife put her, put her own daughter up to this. Said, uh, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And a charger is a, a platter. And the king was sorry. Ne nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given to her. So now he was, he was afraid of the people around him and the fact that he had made an oath. So he was trying to save face, faith. In order to save face, he had to have John's head taken, taken off. Uh, during this time, though, from what I understand, he was, he and John, he kind of liked to hear John talk. Uh, can't remember where I found that out though, so I'll put the reference to it if I can find it. And his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. So Jesus had heard about it, and he's obviously uh, in mourning and we're wanting to mourn and wanting to pray. And so he goes into a desert place, gets in a ship, and sails off to a desert place. Uh, so he's like taking a shortcut across the sea to a certain a certain area that was deserted. And the people followed him along the bank. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and followed him out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw, uh, this is verse 14, great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Uh, compassion is, uh, I've heard it explained as different than sympathy. So sympathy is different than compassion. Compassion is more of a spiritual emotion, emotion that comes from the spirit, from the gut, from the in, from from the heart and it it's uh independent of affection that you would have for people for normal people for instance if your child is sick you have a different emotion than if your neighbor's child is sick you have a stronger emotion that's a soulish emotion but if at the same time you have, you feel the same compassion for the for both, that you wish you could do good for both, regardless of who it is that you love, it has to do with coming from the spirit, then it's described as compassion and it's, it's more uh, a gut felt type of thing. And Jesus was moved by compassion. That's what should move us when we're walking around and we, we pray for people. We pray for people we have compassion on. And it's the way the spirit lets us know who, who we should be praying for. So a lot of times when I'm walking or going somewhere, uh, I'll see somebody with crutches or in a wheelchair or something like that, and I'm not moved by compassion, so I don't do anything. But if I'm moved by compassion, then then I do something. 
and I, I ask if I can pray for them or whatever. So it's, and it's a, a freeing way of doing it. It's a way of letting, because, you know, if you look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's, it's, it talks about how we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest we, anyone should both boast. But we're, we're uh, and I'm paraphrasing this, of course, uh, we're, we are the work of God created to do unto do good works that he has laid out for us. So it's like there's good works for us to do that are planned for us to do. And just because you see work to be done doesn't mean that you are obligated to do it. A good example of this is the, uh, in scripture is the uh, paralytic at the gate beautiful uh, that was brought every day at the t t to sit out front of the temple and beg. And uh, he was like in his 30s, I think it was. So he had been there, being brought there every day for his whole life at the gate beautiful. <laughs> Jesus says and disciples went through that gate uh, quite a bit before Jesus went to the cross and none of them prayed for it. But after the cross, Peter and um, John, I think it was John, Peter and John were going through the gate and he got them reached, uh, was asking for, for alms and Peter healed him. This is, a, you can read about it in Acts chapter three. So in that case, he was, his compassion was moved into him. Uh, Peter had compassion on him, but before there was no compassion. Compassion wasn't motivating them. So they were motivated motivated by compassion, and uh, so and we're well, back to back verse fourteen. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, "This is a desert place, and the time is now past. And the multi send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals." I see preachers pronounce that victuals. Victuals. If you're down south, you know what vittles are. This is, must be southern Israel. Vittles. It's spelled V I C T U A L S, but it's pronounced vittles. So sit down and have some vittles with us. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And when they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes, he said, Bring them hither to me. Now, five loaves, when you're talking about loaves, it's not, they're not like big loaves of bread. This was, a, if you read in other uh, gospels that it was a little boy that had these and he's not carrying around five, five big loaves of bread and a couple of big fishes. He's probably had some, there were small fishes and they were more like, probably like biscuits uh, is the, probably the size of these, these five loaves. So he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and two fishes and looking up to heaven. Now listen very carefully to this because a lot of times we get this wrong. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Now, most people think that Jesus looked up to heaven and thanked the father for the food, but that's not what was said. But let's address praying for a second. The looking up to heaven. Uh, let's just say he was praying. Where was God when Jesus prayed? So now Jesus, you can read in Acts 10, 38, how Jesus walked down here. He is God. He was God. He is God, but he walked as a man. So he was fully man, fully God walking on earth as a man. He, you can see in Philippians two that he kind of ditched his, the God part of him or set that aside. He did not rely on his himself as being God. He referred to himself as son of man most of the time, not son of God, even though he was both son of man and son of God. Um, so this is Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, 
healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus walked as a man. He had the Holy Ghost with him, and God was with him, and God was in heaven. But he was, he was at, so he's, if he was praying, he'd be praying up to God. But where is God for the believer? And this is this is part of the renewing of your mind that that uh, I keep referring to. I've got an itchy nose. <clears throat> if you look in Scripture where God is, He is in heaven, but He's also within the believer, and this is uh, and it's the full Godhead that is within the believer. This is John seven thirty seven through thirty nine. In the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit was going to be given to believers, and believers are going to have the, uh, the Holy Spirit within. So out of the, his belly shall flow rivers of living water is referring to the Holy Spirit that would be within them. This is Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live I, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we got the Holy Spirit in us. We have Christ in us. And uh, this is uh, Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known this, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That just struck <laughs> This has struck me. I've never had it struck me this way before, but the mystery among the Gentiles. Uh, Christ is the Messiah. He is a Jewish. The Jewish Messiah is in a Gentile. A Gentile is an unclean person normally. But anyway, there's another verse about how Christ is in us. And this mystery among the Gentiles Mystery is a, a truth that was completely hidden, might have been hinted at, but it's completely hidden. It is now revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we got this Holy Spirit, and we've got Jesus inside. Now, do we have the Father? Uh, this is John seventeen twenty one. That they all may be as one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So this is a part of a prayer that Jesus prayed in uh, John 17, a very interesting read. If you go to that chapter and read, keeping in mind that Jesus is praying, you see how prayer is done. It's, Jesus didn't just use the Lord's prayer. He, uh, it's just conversation with the Lord. That's all prayer is. And you don't have to, Praying, a lot of people get it wrong and they think they got to sit there and talk the whole time they're talking to Jesus or talking to the Father. Uh, but you're both, it's like 95% listening or just being with God when you pray and 5% talking, maybe. I mean, it's not even, you don't try to divide it in percentages, of course, but but it, there's a lot more of listening and just being in, in his presence when you pray. All right, so let's get back to it. Uh, so the, so uh, the Father's in Jesus, and Jesus is in the Father. So if Jesus is in us, and Father's in Jesus, then the Father's in us also. So we've got the full Godhead inside us. But not only that, this is uh, Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that's the Holy Spirit, he that raised up Christ from the dead also shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So the Holy Spirit is in you, and he is the one that raised up Jesus from the dead. So the power, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you if the Holy Spirit is in you. 
So if you meditate on that, meditate on that until that's how you think all the time, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you with the power that raised Jesus from the dead inside. This is what renewing the mind is about. When you believe all this through, through your heart, and it's second nature to you, to you, when you think about this, when you believe all this through your heart and when you believe God always wants to heal the same way, then you can pray in confidence for someone to be healed and they will be healed. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. That's how you pray, how you get to be able to pray for the sick. You start believing, you start meditating on this, you renew your mind to you start thinking, I've got the Godhead inside me. You're recognizing that you've got the Godhead inside you. You recognize that you've got the power of God inside you. And you, it, and when you do renew your mind, you end up knowing what God's will is. You can see that in Romans 1 through, Romans 12, 1 through 2. So when you start believing that God always wants to heal, and you've got all that in you, all you're doing is praying for the person to be healed. However you feel you should do it by faith and then just trust that God is going to do it because he is there with you. So when you're praying, a good way of telling whether you, your, your mind is renewed, when you pray, and this is what got this all started, when you pray, if you're thinking Jesus is up in heaven or God's up in heaven, Father's you're up in heaven, and that's where you're praying, where you're talking to, then you're not there yet. You'll be there when you start praying to God and realizing it is he's inside you. So you're looking down at your belly. That's why you bow your head, because <laughs> you're looking at your down to your belly where rivers of living water is flowing from. So that's the secret for being able to pray it, for people or do anything really is, you know, when God's got your back, you know, he's with you, you know, he's inside you, you know, that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside you and you just trust in it and it happening and it, and it happens. And let's see, let's go to, uh, quickly go to Acts chapter three. Cause a lot of people believe that, uh, this kind of thing died off with the uh, apostles. But this is this is that verse where Peter and John uh, healed the uh, paralytic, and then they went into the temple, and people started gathering around, all excited and looking at Peter and uh, John as if they were, you know. Super saints, because that's what you think of people. That's what religious people think of people that can do this kind of thing. Any Christian can pray for the sick and they get well. Anybody can do it. You just have to have faith that it's going to happen. And this is this is proof of it because Peter describes how this guy got healed. Here we go, verse 12, <laughs> 312. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? So Peter's <laughs> denying that it has anything to do with him or his holiness. And if you, and then they, he preaches a little sermon and then he gets down here to uh, verse 16. And he says, and uh, let's say 15, and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, had made this man strong whom you see, whom ye see and know ye. The faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So it was faith in Jesus' name that caused that man to be healed, not Peter being an apostle. So let's get back. All right, so we we're back to Jesus looking up to heaven. He didn't look up to heaven and, and pray. That's how, what happened was when I was doing this, okay, he's looking up to heaven to pray to the Father because this is the way I was thinking too. And so I started putting all these notes together. And then I got back and started reading and said, what are you doing? He said anything to the Father. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. He, he blessed. 
And the word blessed there is uh, eulogies, eulogies. And it means to thank or invoke a benediction upon to prosper. <laughs> he was he was blessing the bread as a man. Remember Acts ten thirty eight, man walking rightly with God. Jesus blessed the bread, which I interpret that to mean to cause kingdom laws to be in effect on the bread. And what is what is uh, what what was the kingdom law that was in effect? It was the the, the law of plenty. Because what happens is he gives the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled and took up the fragments that remained, twelve basketfuls, and they had eaten were the, and they that had eaten were about five thousand men beside women and children. So when he blessed the bread, he put faith that the kingdom laws, the kingdom laws are in effect for that bread, which is the law of plenty. There's two laws that we're going to go over in here. And where this law of plant, where these laws came from, or, uh, and it's just, it's the way I think. You don't have to think this way. This is just the way I'm thinking because of a dream I had. I had dreamed I'd gone to, I've mentioned this before. I dreamed I was in heaven at a party in a house. And um, there was an angel with me, like an escort. And they were pouring what looked like to be lemonade. I'm not sure what it was, but they were pouring lemonade in the glasses and for, you know, for people to drink. Somebody was walking around, picked up the, the pitcher, almost full of lemonade, went around pouring all the glasses, lemonade in the glasses, and then put the pitcher back down. And the pitcher was still just as full of lemonade. <laughs> I was going, what, what happened? So I asked, asked the guy, what happened there? And he said, well, it's the law of plenty. In heaven, there is no lack. There's always plenty of whatever you need. So it's like the law of gravity for us. You know. Now, how does the law of plenty work? I don't know. But as I'm going to go over some more examples later on in here. But um, there, there seems to be two laws that I've, I can identify. One's the law of plenty, where you can see oil gets multiplied. There was, it, it was just several instances of it. And just as there's a law of gravity, if you imagine yourself before, uh, well, the guy that discovered gravity, can't remember his name right offhand. But before that, nobody knew how like, gravity worked. They knew that we got stuck to the earth. They had everybody had theories, but they knew there was some something that kept you to the stuck to the earth. And Isaac Newton's the one that figured out what the law of gravity is. And then after that, oh, everybody's go oh. But before that, everybody thought gravity was just kind of like magic. It was the same thing with the kingdom of heaven and their in its laws. It looks like magic to us when something multiplies. You know, I, I sit there and try to imagine what it would be like to have all these, these, these few fish and you can just keep on taking fish and bread out, fish and bread out, and there's still just as many fish in there. So how does that happen? You know, at first I was thinking, well, those little eggs come in and if the fish actually grows. But now I'm thinking it's like you grab a tail, tail of a fish, you start peeling. It's like peeling it from a piece of paper. And as it's peeling, the cells are multiplying and it's actually just kind of like duplicating itself. So that's the way I imagine it, but I don't know how it works. But yeah, that's nothing wrong with imagining how it works, but that's, that's, so that's how I do it. Uh, so, and they did all eat and were filled and took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full and they had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he got his disciples, get in a boat, take off, I'm going to send the multitudes away. Now, what's involved in sending the multitudes away? You know, you're dismissed. It was what our preachers would do. If you are all dismissed, you can go home. <laughs> so a lot of people have a tendency to think oh, that's how Jesus did it. But if he sends the multitudes away, he didn't send the multitude. That means he probably went up to each little group of people that were identified and talked to them and sent and sent them away and blessed them and sent them away. And that's 30 minutes. 
So that's a good place to stop. So we'll we'll pick up uh we'll pick up on Matthew 14 next time and um uh, maybe I'll give you some reading assignments. <laughs> you might want to read uh Exodus 15 22 through 26. These are some some evidences of kingdom laws being in effect. It's Exodus 15, 22 through 26. This is what I call the king, the law of borrowed attributes. I don't know of a better name for it, but it's basically where attributes of one, attributes of something in this world are borrowed by another object in this world. Yeah, read it. Read these, and you'll probably be see see what I'm talking about. This is Exodus 15, 22 through 26, Second Kings 4, 38 through 44, Second Kings 6, 4 through 7. And that'll do it. So thanks for your time. See you guys. See you next time.